Well, no wonder I'm tired. <laughs> 4,000 of you on a regular basis over 17 years. That's got to exhaust anybody. Before I get into my comments, I want to make a comment about what Joni said. The fact that I'm leaving the facilitation will not make up the million dollar shortfall that we <laughs> talked about earlier. So I just want to, I want to clear that part up. The second observation, and you can't make this stuff up, right? Today when Clay came in to talk to the current vict I mean the current participants of our president's program, somehow we evolved into a final story. And the final story had to deal with how in his youth he went out and had to take care of a chicken in his backyard so they could have dinner. And he kept referring to his skills as a chicken plucker. <laughs> Every time he said it, I quit breathing. I kid. <laughs> How do you get through chicken plucker eight or nine times <laughs> without screwing up? So, so, so the Imes thing was easy, the books are easy, but getting through chicken plucker eight different times, it's, it, it takes it to a level I haven't thought about. So I, I'm, I'm highly impressed with that. So, so. Uh, tonight I just want to spend a little bit of time and uh, kind of do a little bit of reflection, uh, thinking about my 17 plus years of this program, but even going back before that where we started thinking about this program and started thinking about who helps the entrepreneur? Who really cares about the business owner enough? And that what we found is that the big companies, it's pretty easy because we have budgets and we can send ourselves off to seminars. We can bring people in to talk with us. But when it came to the private business owners and the small business owners in the communities, it's pretty tough to get help without a price tag associated with it. And so the concept was, how do you really go about helping the business owners? So I was thinking about the meetings going back to 94, 95, and I was thinking about those meetings are all about what is it we can do to help you? And as I fast forward 17 plus years later, the excitement is saying thanks for what you've done and what you've accomplished. And I could take you down a 17 year uh, biopic of what went on over here, but uh, for those of you who suffered me, by the way, for the, I'd like to see the hands again of those who attended the President's course today. Eight hours of me, <laughs> followed by another part of me. Now, I'm not used to doing anything in less than eight hours out here, so I'm going to ask you to sit back and kind of <laughs> bear with me as I kind of get through the key parts here. Uh, but the, the point I wanted to make is when we start talking about the importance of professional managers, the importance of helping people, and I started thinking about where do we get this belief? And I started thinking about a point in time, and I go back to our groundbreaking. And there's two things I remember. The first thing I remember is I had just had rotator cuff surgery, and I was told, you gotta take your arm out of the sling, and you gotta wield a shovel. <laughs> so that's wielding. It's, it's gingerly holding it with a hand that worked, right? But the second thing I remember is I could talk to you about 96, 97, all the things we did. We started out by teaching planning. But to really put it in context, it all kind of came together when Clay made those comments. And it was the end of his speech, and he said, the purpose of this center, and I paraphrase, is to create jobs. And he also said, and help aspiring entrepreneurs. But the thing that stuck in everybody's mind is, I hope you will enjoy Aileron, your new center. Okay. That resonated hard. And he said, you know what? That's a different message that this place is built for you. And I'd love to tell you those comments were new, but they weren't. They were just stated at that particular event because we were having a groundbreaking. Those are the very statements that have driven Aileron since day one. What can we do for you? And what I recall over all the years, the most commonly asked question by Clay is, tell me what they need. You're in front of them all the time. Tell me what they need so we can figure out what we need to provide. And so as I think about that statement, this place was built for you, I'd like to say it a little bit differently. It is yours. It's your responsibility. And I'm going to come back to talking about this as we go forward, but this place was built for you. And Clay talked about it tonight a little bit. Joni's talked about it. Scott's talked about it. But I think the key is where do you take it as you go forward over the years? In, in conjunction with Aileron, the staff, in conjunction with all the resources, in conjunction with all of our contributors, 
where do you take this over the years? And I'm going to talk about that today a little bit. Now, before I get there, I want to do a quick review of professional management and kind of the principles and the concepts that kind of drove us all these years, just to make sure you remember, because some of you haven't been here in a long time. You know, Mark Forns, I mean, the guy, we had to dust him off and bring him out tonight. <laughs> Forns went to our very first program back in 1937, if I recall, <laughs> or 96. He keeps hanging around. He, he hasn't fallen on his nose yet. So I want to kind of talk about the things that have been done in professional management. But I want to remind you about what professional management is all about. And I'm going to do it by talking about what drives us. A passion is what drives us. But that passion is for a professionally managed organization and what it can mean. It's a passion that we have. It's not, it's not a job. It's a deep belief that you can take this thing to a level nobody's thought of yet. Secondly, it's a continuing belief in the free enterprise system that Clay has already talked about tonight, so I won't bore you with that detail, but it's all about you creating jobs. It's all about you proving that the best place to spend time, people, and money is in the private business. It's about practitioner to practitioner assistance. A lot of us teach at different universities, a lot of us teach in different colleges, but the key to what this place has always been is a practitioner being a practitioner. Uh, I have regaled many of you with my successes. I spent considerably more time with my failures, right? That is the, the journey you've taken and what you learn about running a business, the mistakes you make. And so the only way we can really make this a meaningful experience is to be in the trench right alongside you, to work with you, to let you know that, you know, it's not perfect. You're not going to have a 100% success factor. It's OK to make mistakes. It's OK to change direction. And we've all done it. And so the concept was to share with you practitioner to practitioner. And so that's why we want useful education, not academic education. We try to stay away from the theory unless we can convert the theory to the practice. We also wanted to make sure we have real implementation assistance. Our business advisors here are pros. They've run companies. Many of them have run companies well and poorly, as they'll be the first to admit. Many of them have been in a lot of businesses, but they're there for one purpose, to make sure that they kind of provide guidance and support to you as you continue your journey in professional management. There's no agenda other than your success. There's no gain for a Bill Barclow or a Dinsmore, or people like that who are here to, on a regular basis helping you. And so I think the key to this whole model is there's real help. And if you're a real business owner, you know you need it. And you know you need to reach out for it. Uh, one of the things that I probably didn't do well in my career was ask for help soon enough. And I think that's one of the messages we want you to get. We all need help. You're in the world's loneliest jobs. You don't have peers. You have employees. You have owners. You have people who would want to advise and counsel you. But you need peers. And tonight you're sitting in a, amidst the room of peers. So keeping that constant learning and growth together and helping each other. And then we want to make sure that those peers really benefit you. Uh, people say to me, you know, I, I live in a country now, uh, in the southern part of the country, and I'm starting to get a Hispanic workforce. I don't know what to do about it. I've never managed a Hispanic workforce before. I say, you know, I happen to live in Colorado and Southern California. They've been managing Hispanic workforces for 25 years. Why don't you go out and learn from people who are already doing it? There's no requirement to reinvent the wheel every time. Go learn from others who are doing it well. Somewhere the future has been created, jump into it. Grab a hold of it. Strengthen your business and learn from others. That's the value of a peer network, and we don't reach out for it enough. So I'm challenging you to continue doing that as you move your businesses forward. And last but not least, we have no agenda other than you. Your success is our success. The better you do, the happier we are, the more we can help provide. And it's really a joy to see all the giving back that's been going on. So let's kind of talk our way through what is professional management. Uh, you've seen the evolution of the DOC model, and the concept of the DOC model is professional management is not an easy process, but it ought to be a simple process. You ought to figure out how to focus on the things that are important. You ought to make sure that you have your business under control. And we like to come up with terms maybe that are a little softer, but at the end of the day, you want a business that's in control regardless of the environment in which you're operating. 
I made the comment today, there's no such thing as a recession if you're in business. There's just an operating environment. It's the next operating environment. And how do I continue to build myself, my company, and my business during a changing environment? Recessions are economic terms, right? The economists use those. For businesses, it's a different operating environment. I, I always have to say this. What, why do we have economists? It was designed to make meteorologists feel good about their profession. <laughs> so beyond that, we can't come up with a single reason. So my point is play the hand you're dealt, right? If you're going into a weaker economy, position your business to prosper in a weaker economy. If you're going into a growth economy, make sure you're managing your rate of growth and you're in control. This is a control system. But it begins with a guiding philosophy. And this is one thing I've been spending a lot of time talking to business owners about is, what is your guiding philosophy? Why do you exist? Tough question. A lot of you are in business already. Clay mentioned it already that you, some of you probably couldn't work for others. Some of you have been blessed to be second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth generations. But the question still comes down to why do you exist? What is the purpose of your business? Secondly, what must you accomplish to make it worthwhile? Third, what is it you do that matters and how do you know? And fourth, where should your resources be invested for the future? It's not difficult, but it says it's my philosophy. It guides everything I do. It's a personal vision. It's my own personal passion that's going to be able to allow me to drive everything I want to build in the future. Third, it links your dreams and your goals and your timetables to something that you can get your arms around. And so when you start to think about a professional management system, we have a very effective, <coughs> simplistic model. There are many ways to embrace professional management. The concept is build a system, build a process. Make sure that you are able to look at the total pieces and parts of your enterprise. And the DOC model is designed to do that. The evolution is even better. It takes it down to a more practical level, a more granular level. And I think that's a, a tremendous step in a forward progress. But I think it comes down to saying, at the end of the day, it's still about you and the nickel you have put at risk. It's really important. Next, it's solid business foundation that Scott just talked about. This is not rocket science. It's all about understanding your fundamentals and applying them on a regular basis. Strategy. Do I need a plan? Uh, we just did this today in the class. People said, I said, everybody in this room has a strategic plan. Everybody. My victim was sitting over here. He said, I don't have a strategic plan. Please raise your hand because so the bleeding stops. <laughs> so I said, I started asking him questions. And I asked about eight questions. And in the context of those eight questions, I asked him rapid fire without much time for him to think about it. He outlined the entire strategic direction of his enterprise. He just hadn't written it down yet. He just hasn't shared it enough with others. You all have it up here. As long as you believe in it, it helps to put it on paper, but more importantly, it helps to talk about it on an ongoing business. But it is a group of foundation principles when working together cause you to be in better control and to prosper more. It's planning. It's setting direction. It's understanding and having the right people. And the right people are those who fit in the culture you employ. It's having a structure that works, that simplifies what you do. And it's preventing yourself from having a lot of surprises in your business. It doesn't have to be more complicated than that. You mess with a system, you change one part, you impact all. So if you take the quick summary of the whole president's course, for those of you, you still need to come back tomorrow, by the way, if you <laughs> went through day one, that's it. It's a control system. It begins with your philosophy, what's important to you. It links your dreams, goals, and timetables. It's built on a foundation of solid principles. And what do I mean by that? And people talk to me about, well, you do strategic planning. What can we do that's more exciting next year? And I say, well, you could first of all believe in strategic planning. If you don't believe in strategic planning, which is a foundation stone, teaching you how to do scenario plans, simulations, war games, strategic conversation is limited to zero value. There's no foundation for it. So the first thing is, I believe in strategic planning. I believe it makes a difference in my business. I believe it's worth investing in. Those are the foundation stones. And when you put the foundation stones together, you're in control. You minimize surprises. And that's part of the payoff system, right? The payoff will come after you first and foremost recognize by attacking this, 
I now can define why I put my capital at risk. It gives me a little bit of relaxation, right? I thought this thing through. I figured it out. I have taken this risk, but it doesn't seem like such a great risk anymore because I'm in control. Secondly, I'm clear on what's worth happening. Uh, you heard Joni talk about make or break issues. I have yet to see the organization that has more than three. There, and I don't care what size you are. There are very few make or break things that go on in your business. But they're big ones and they deserve your focus. Qualified people in the right job. Keeping pace with the technology necessary to be a player. Having the capital required in order to be a player in your industry. The big one is managing your rate of growth. Not stopping your rate of growth, but managing it. And I mentioned today, and I've said this for years in this program, two killers of private enterprise, right? First and foremost is high growth. will kill more businesses faster than anything else because it outruns your competency, it outruns your skill sets. The second one is a fear of investment because you're spending your own money. But more often than not, what we won't invest in is people. We'll buy that press, we'll buy that piece of equipment, we'll buy that truck, but we'll scrimp on buying people. Most important investment you can make in a private business is the right people in a key job. I came out of big companies with lots of bodies. We can push a rock up a hill. I could get away with many average people because I had a lot of them. But a smaller, privately held business cannot afford to have a mediocre player in a key job. And so it's really important that you're going to accomplish something. You understand what it's going to take to put it in place. Third. Focus and clarity. You can sum up everything we try to talk about. You've seen me go through the stress model. The stress model is all about ambiguity and loss of control. The anecdote to that is a better focus and tighter clarity. What are we trying to do that's worth it? And whose responsibility is it to get it done? So making sure that's clear so your business operates simply. Making sure that what you do in your thought process drives the work of the enterprise on a day-by-day -day basis. I talk a lot about the importance of the vision and the mission of an enterprise. I think they're more important than the plan. If I can get those two right, if I can understand what outcome we're trying to achieve, and I can understand what we do, planning gets pretty simple. But I need to get those two key pieces in place correctly managed. One of the things I used to do in my businesses in the past when I'd see people working on things that were not in line with our vision and mission, I'd ask them first and foremost, what are, what are you doing? And they'd tell me, and I'd say, will that get us to our vision or our mission? And if the answer was no, then I'd say, then you have one other answer to give me. How soon can you stop working on it? Because I understand there's going to be a fire that we have to put out, but the fires don't drive us. The vision drives us. Get back on path. That's why we put capital at risk. That's why we invest time, people, and money. And I, and I have some courage. Uh, we've gone through a period of time here. Uh, 2007 was when the recession really began, but we didn't pay a lot of attention because it hadn't hit our financials yet, right? The worst tool in management, your financials. It's an autopsy report. All it tells you is how good or bad the decisions you made six months, 12 months, or 18 months ago were. And so what happened is that it finally flowed through in 08, the average company probably in this area fell by about 30 to 35 percent. And I said many times, and I usually hide behind a podium when I say it, we deserved it because we had a lot of indicators coming. We saw changes coming. We saw markets softening. We saw a lot of things starting to go in against us, but we invoked the famous words of, it's not a problem yet. And when we finally hit us, then we tried to bail ourselves out. So one of the things a professionally managed organization that's in control will do is give you the courage to make the calls in advance of the need. So it's important that you start thinking down the road not just dealing with what's in front of you. I talked about the payoff, better focus. Absolutely better focus. Gives you back a life for one thing if you don't have one. It gives you back, why are we going to work every day? And you give you better control. Supports the growth of the free enterprise system and do not underestimate that. Without you, this place is sitting very stagnant to declining. You create jobs, huge payoff. We need to create jobs, more of them, better jobs, more thought positions. It strengthens your communities. It significantly reduces your chance of failure. 
Uh, Clay said it today when he came into the president's course, and I'll echo it. We don't know of a business that's embraced a professional management system that failed. We don't know anybody who has come through the programs here who embraced the concepts and put them in practice who has failed. And so that system of management is critically important to the future success of your enterprise. And then obviously you ought to get a greater return on your, your investment because you're in control, you're focused on where you're going to be. So that's just kind of a quick overview of why professional management, if you don't remember it. It's designed for you to be in better control of your company, it's designed for you to prosper, but from our side, it's designed for you to create jobs, it's designed for you to give back, it's designed for you to build stronger communities. Okay. So let me uh, move off of this though, and you, you know me, I never do a speech without talking about a current issue or problem. And I'm gonna give you one. If I look at where people spend time, we did a survey of 325 business owners, and we asked them to tell us, where do you spend your time? I don't think there's gonna be any surprise to most of us, 10% looking backwards, 85 plus percent looking at our current situation, and less than 5% of positioning our, ourselves for the future. And we really think that several of these folks were lying. <laughs> <laughs> that, that it really hadn't gotten to that looking down the road. So when I look at that concept, I'm seeing it happening again. As I go around and meet people in classes and as I go around and do my own consulting base, what I'm recognizing is something I don't like, and it's an observation. We know the economy is improving. Secondly, our numbers are looking better. And this has been an interesting dynamic here. Every time your numbers look better, our attendance goes down, right? One of two things occurs, right? Either you say, Eureka, I am healed, because my numbers are good again, or B, you say, I'm too busy to leave. That got us in trouble before. So we're gonna encourage you that the best time to leave is now. The best time to spend time here is, to, is the best time to spend time thinking is right now. And so we're looking at numbers looking better. Companies have started hiring again. Jobs are going up. Uh, we live in Denver, Colorado. You can sell a house now in an hour. Every construction company in the place is thrilled by what's going on out there. Getting back to normal. Scary word. There, I've said it forever, there's no such thing as normal. And those of us who think there is are gonna be in for a rude awakening. We're playing not to lose. I'm watching people take very careful risks right now. They were so badly wounded between 08 and 11 and 12, they're incredibly cautious and they're ignoring the lessons learned. And I sat in gas lines in the 1970s and we swore then we'd never have a big car again. We have two SUVs, right, in our house. So, you know, we kind of repeat the problems of the past. But if I look at that, the disturbing thing is what it tells me. The disturbing thing is it tells me we're entering the comfort zone again. And we're sitting back and we're saying, things are better now. Let's talk about the difficulty of being in a comfort zone. We become more risk averse than ever. Just don't rock this boat. We drop to a knee, we pull out our rosary beads or our prayer beads, we face whatever direction we like to pray in, and so we say, please God, do not let me screw this up again. Let me hang on and hold on to this. We have an unfounded sense of security. We believe that things are good. There's a lot of things in the economy that would tell you they're not great. There are a lot of things that say you don't have a lot of help out there that you're gonna to have to manage your own success. We fail to recognize that markets are different, that customers are changing, that their demands are greater, that their demands are different. They learned a lot too in this period of time. And we've become very vulnerable to more aggressive competitors when we begin to circle the wagons and try to hold on to what we do. So one of the challenges we give you is to learn to be comfortable by being in the discomfort zone. What is that? Challenge your system, even when it doesn't need to be challenged. Blow it up every chance you get mentally to make sure you understand whether it's the right system that's gonna take us to the right place. Secondly, be receptive to new ideas, to new ways of doing business. Don't go back to normal. Take some risks. Embrace uncertainty and deal with it. Don't wait till you need to fix something. 
recognize there's some things I don't get out in the marketplace, or I don't get in a competitive situation, or I don't understand in the, in the customer needs, get involved earlier than later. Anticipate, don't turn around and try to fix. And last but not least, go for the batting average. You're gonna make mistakes. There's no, there's no perfect business out there. Clay made mistakes in his company, I've made more mistakes I'd like to count, continue to do so, but I'm looking for that batting average. So I've gotta take some risks, I gotta try things, I gotta see if I can get it to the next level. And I, the importance of doing that discomfort zone is the fact that you don't let your business go on autopilot. You're constantly looking at it, you're constantly in control of it. So let me leave you with a couple of challenges. Uh, you saw one challenge that Scott put up. I'd like to put up another one. This is for you, primarily the business owners. First and foremost, if you don't have a guiding philosophy, and many of us do not, and the way I can tell that is when I say, how many have a guiding philosophy, and then I watch eyeballs head toward shoes. <laughs> and then I recognize right off the bat that, please God, don't call on me, Mark Thompson. So, <clears throat> so I get to think about those kind of things. Secondly, know what you must achieve. Don't just keep working at it. You don't have a job, you have a company. You have a passion, you have a belief system. Understand what's worth it. Understand what you really need to accomplish to take it to the next level. Third, be in control in any environment. Uh, we had some people that did really well in the recession. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna call one out. Where's, where's Greg McAfee, is he in the room? McAfee Heating and Air, you, you probably know him because he has every commercial on television other than the one Heidi Honda has here in town, right? <laughs> so, but Greg was growing at an average of 20% a year from 2008 to now. He didn't participate in the recession. Many of you did not participate in the recession. You were in control of your companies and you were able to prosper in tough marketplace. You don't have to accept what's tossed at you. You can get back and make it work, right? Third, make a difference. That sounds like a hollow comment, but make a difference. Create something of value, not just to you, to your employees, to your stakeholders, to your vendors, to the people that you deal with. Make a difference in everything you do. And prosper. And as you prosper, create jobs and strengthen your communities, okay? Regain the joy of private ownership. Uh, and I, I can't say that more often than I say it right now. I watched The Walking Wounded from 2008 to now. And yeah, we were wounded. And we ended up figuring out we had jobs. And we stopped enjoying the private ownership. We started looking at, man, I'm trapped. And I would tell you between 2008 and 2012, the majority of people that I saw come through programs were trapped. They were on a plateau. They weren't sure what to do. They didn't have a lot of resources to make it happen, and they were sitting there trying to deal with the pain. They lost the joy of private ownership. Uh, we really challenge you to get that back. You've put your capital at risk. You ought to really enjoy what it is you do, not just do more work. If you're working 16 hours a day at break even, I would recommend you go get a job, right? But if you really believe in what you do, then take it to the next level. And then I'm gonna go back to that comment that I made earlier about this place was built for you. And I'm paraphrasing your words, so, but what the heck. <laughs> so I'm paraphrasing your words. So if that's true, then I'm gonna throw some challenges at you. If it's yours, you have the responsibility going forward as the business owners to help take Aileron to another level. They can't do it alone. They got a good staff, they got a growing staff, but they have a tremendous audience and cadre of people who are succeeding. We need you to continue building it to the next level. We need you to continue challenging Aileron to support you even more. We need you to challenge your peers to do better. But it is yours, do more with it. Secondly, be the model for professional management. We're one model, we, we walk the talk here, we follow what we're supposed to do. We have plans, we have processes, we have review processes. We have everything that we talk about in classes. But what we love to see is to be able to point the finger and say, let me point out so-and-so over here. Their company is professionally managed. Go spend time with them. 
You become the model of that. You become the disciples of that. You're the ones that go out and sell the value of professional management. Learn from each other and grow. Don't be quite so insular. It's not all about you trying to figure out how to make it happen alone. Tons of help out there. Ask for it. The best way to get help, raise your hand. Ask for it. Everybody needs help. We challenge you to ask for more help. We challenge you to help each other and embrace building the concept of professional management. And continue creating jobs because we can't think of a better measure of your success. If you look at what we care about, it's the jobs you create, going back to Clay's comments on that groundbreaking day. This place exists for you to prosper, to build an entrepreneurial spirit out, and create jobs for the future. And last but not least, the challenge on that is make it better. Don't just continue it. Take it to a new level. Now, having said that, I want to leave you with some management lessons. Things that I have learned from you, uh, things that I've learned from others, uh, things that I have stumbled over or stumbled on, but some key management lessons that I'd like to leave you with. First and foremost, look forward and outward, not inward and backward. You've heard me say this in class a million times, right? When riding a dead horse, dismount, <laughs> right? Don't spend a lot of time figuring out why the horse died. Get a better horse. Look forward, look outward. Where can you take this company while you're busy operating it in today's environment? Where can you go next that matters and makes it of value? Concentrate on your make or break issues. The two or three things are the only thing that are worth planning around. How do I really make sure that I deal with these so I prosper? If I deal with my make or break issues appropriately, I prosper. If I don't deal with them, it doesn't matter how well you do on everything else, the big issues will take you down. So your focus as the CEOs and business owners is to focus on the make or breaks. And you've all heard me say it a million times, you are employed from the neck up as business owners. Learn to stop touching stuff. Learn to let the people who work for you touch the stuff. Your job is to make sure your company can prosper and you prosper when you pay attention to the big items. Oops, sorry. Manage the system. You've, we've heard this talked about work on your business, not in the business. I just take 10% of your time to work on the business. You know, I'd love to tell you that the model is 80 to 90% of your time should be spent in thought, but I'd love to see you spend 10% of your time working on your business on a regular basis. Put, the, put a number on that. If you have a normal 2,000-hour business year, which, of course, we all have as entrepreneurs, maybe 1,500 is all we have to really work, right? <laughs> if you gave me 10% of a year, that's 200 hours in deep thought, thinking about how to position your company to make it better. That's going to put you at the top of the game for most businesses around. 10% is what you ought to be able to at least provide in deep thought about how to make this better, how to take it someplace that really makes a key difference. Trust your people, and then that actually let them do something important. I see way too much going on now where the business owners are deep in the weeds, and it's gotten even worse. They became sure in, since 2008 that the reason the business fell is they weren't down deep in the weeds working on things and they got out of control. So they've all jumped back into the foxhole, right? Business owners need to get back out of that foxhole. You've got good people, put them to work, let them do something important, let them share in the difference they help create. And regardless of how big you become, regardless of how diverse you are, regardless of how geographically dispersed you are, keep your business simple. The more geographically dispersed, the more business you're involved in, the more important it is to have some centralized control and focus on a few key important things so the business will prosper. So those are management lessons. Now, what have I learned personally? What I've learned personally is when I take the time to get facts, I make better decisions. Go figure, right? As opposed to jumping in the midst of things, you're sitting back and you're thinking. You're gathering information. You're learning what I need to do to make this happen. Then I, the mantra that I've pushed for years in my business, think first before you plan. 
When you plan first, you just jump into creating another version of your current self. Think first. Answer those key questions of why you exist, what you do that matters. Then plan about how you can implement them. And then once you get through planning, stop talking and get moving. Do something. Put it in practice. Put it in play. Hire slowly. Terminate rapidly. You've got to have the right people in the key jobs. I would go the other way in my life. I, if I said it today in class. I said if I had a spot open in my company long enough, the next person that walked in the door who could take nourishment unaided was mine. I would put that person to work. You don't ever want to do that. Take your time to find the right person, the person that fits. Don't just live with credentials. There are plenty of credentials out there. There are not a lot of people who will fit your environment. Take your time. Keep the work on your desk if you have to until you find the right person. We talk Board of Advisors. Clay says we have nothing to sell. We sell the concept of a board passionately. It's the best thing you can do for yourself. And I started too late getting a board. I had a board because I was a public company, but they didn't look like my advisors. They looked more like my bosses. And so it took me a while to get into the hang of there's a value to having an advisory group that helps you think for you at a much deeper level. Can't sell this enough. Always a board of advisors. People who are risk-taking peers, people who can think, people who can challenge you to think at another level. And then last but not least, something I learned is nothing you do is unobserved. So be careful. In the conduct of your business, you are not one of the gang. You are the model for the gang. And so everything that's being done is embraced by you, is paid attention to by them. And so you need to be your model of professional management. Okay? So those are kind of thoughts I leave you with. Uh, personally, I know a lot of you probably know that I have said this will be my last year on the, on the platform facilitating. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And how did I come to this decision? Let me put up my 25 years of fun. And it truly has been. Uh, as I go back, these are the things I have developed over the time, courses. Two courses, two AMA president courses, with the help from Mary Connors. She's here somewhere, right? With the help of Mary Connors. Aileron's version of the course for president, we rewrote it five times. Senior executive courses, three. Planning courses, nine. And so forth. these are the courses we created. Then I went to the other side, and I said, okay, how about the facilitation side of this game? How many programs have I facilitated? First and foremost, CEO level courses. I'll just put them up. No sense doing the math here, right? And then I heard 4,000 a night. No wonder I'm tired. And I said, you know, if you think about that and you look at all that, it really has been a tremendous amount of fun, but it takes a toll. But I will tell you the fun part is that we all look forward to reward and recognition, right? And this has been a very rewarding year, 25 years. You know, in my early years, I had dreamt about the Pulitzer Peace Prize. I mean, the Nobel Peace Prize, the Pulitzer Prize, the Medal of Freedom, the Economist Man of the Year. And so, didn't quite get those. <laughs> but what I'd like to do is to just brag a little bit and just humbly put up some of my tremendous rewards and recognition over the year. So bear with me. Three million flight miles. <laughs> Lifetime platinum status with United Airlines. <laughs> Lifetime executive elite, not just executive, executive elite with National Car. Marriott, Lifetime platinum. And, to my wife's joy, 3,200 nights away from home, which is why we're married 45 years, right? <laughs> If you put that in numbers, that comes out to about eight years and nine months I have spent away from home, not counting my military service. So this is just in the business world. And so my final accomplishment is a night in my own bed, and it is priceless, all right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that, there are many rumors going around, and I want to set them straight. It's a new chapter of my life, not retiring for two reasons. Uh, I spent a little time in the military. The military has two terms. They talk about the official truth and the ground truth. 
The official truth is what you tell the generals when you report in as to how you're doing. The ground truth is what's actually happening that causes real activity to occur. So the official truth is I'm not retiring because I'm not done yet. My goal is to not be as often on the platform, but more time creating content, deepening my knowledge to be more beneficial to business owners. The ground truth is life's reality, second home to pay for, <laughs> right? Lack hobbies. <laughs> Truly a mediocre golfer. <laughs> Easily bored. And let me leave you with a big one. My wife, Kathy's formula. And let me leave you with Kathy's formula. Very simply stated. Twice the husband divided by no income <laughs> equals not <laughs> happening. <laughs> so, not retiring, just working closer to home. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.